Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 10, For People, Planet, and Peace in the State of Maine. Lisa Savage is running for Senate in the state of Maine against Republican incumbent Susan Collins. Lisa is a longtime anti-war and environmental organizer, as well as being a public school teacher and a grandmother. Although she has been an active member of the Green Party, Lisa is running as an independent candidate due to restrictive ballot access laws in Maine. The state does, however, boast ranked choice voting, which gives independent candidates a better shot. Lisa and I spoke on May 7, 2020 and covered a lot of ground. COVID-19 relief, including her call for a people's bailout, health care, agriculture, how ranked choice voting works, campaigning during a pandemic, the recently released documentary Planet of the Humans, a Green New Deal, and U.S. militarism. If Lisa wins, she will certainly be one of the most progressive people to ever serve in the U.S. Senate. Thank you for joining me today, Lisa. I appreciate you spending some time with me. Thank you for inviting me, Colibri. It's nice to be with you. I'd like to start today with the COVID-19 pandemic. The response from the corporate duopoly in Washington, D.C., has been entirely inadequate so far, as I'm sure you've noticed, and many people are experiencing hardship. But I see that you are calling for a people's bailout. So can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, We've now seen three pieces of legislation passed, and they're debating the fourth, I believe, right now, or maybe it's been three and a half, bailing out different um, sectors in society. Corporations have gotten trillions of unaccounted for dollars. We've seen uh, uh, some relief to hospitals. We've seen some money put into unemployment compensation, and we've seen some money uh, put into um, hospitals and um, uh, small businesses also in the form of loans and payroll protection and so forth. But the uh, paltry amount of money that was budgeted for individual uh, directly are unable to pay their bills was extremely austere compared with other wealthy nations. And many of us, myself and my husband included, have yet to receive that one paltry payment. So we uh, know that one third of people in the U.S. were unable to make their rent payment on April 1st. We haven't seen the statistics. I haven't seen the statistics yet for May 1st, but I suspect it was even a greater percentage of the population than one third unable to make the rent. And we um, are, I just yesterday read a, a shocking report about how many families with small children are experiencing food insecurity and how many mothers responded to a, an academic um, study uh, say, you know, saying, I've cut down on meals for my children. My children are often hungry. I teach school in a very uh, rural, very low income part of my state, Maine, and I'm uh, well aware of how very close to abject poverty many of the families um, in my community are. But I think that the pandemic throwing so many people out of work has um, exacerbated the problem hugely. And uh, Congress continues providing relief for their uh, big campaign donors, the corporations that give them millions and millions of dollars to get reelected, yet they have failed to really bail out the American people. Or really, I would be in favor of providing uh, relief for anyone who's a resident in the U.S. So this would include also relief for um, rent? Yes, we also, my campaign also has a a petition prior to the people's bailout. uh, We uh, put up a petition uh, demanding that there be relief for renters and um, homeowner mortgages. So distinguishing between, you know, commercial mortgage holders who make money off um, being the landlord of multiple units, but homeowners that are trying to to stay in their home and um, to provide relief 
in the meaning that don't just freeze rents and mortgage payments that just postpones the problem if people are out of work they're going to be no more able to pay their rent six months from now than they are right now um, but to put a freeze on evictions because obviously people experiencing homelessness is a huge problem in a pandemic where people are told just stay home and then it overlooks the fact that millions of americans have no home to stay in and certainly not being able to pay the rent two r- months running makes uh, for a, a huge amount of growth in housing insecurity. But a people's bailout would be in the, in, in, the, in the form of direct payments to the people, such as other countries are doing. I believe Canada gave each um, uh, of its um, people, adults anyway, $2,000 a month. And, um, you know, almost all the other wealthy countries have provided similar relief because you can't ask people to stay home and not go to their job and not continue earning money. And at the same time, they, how are how will they eat? How will they pay their bills? And when it comes to the bills that are related to health care that more and more people will be getting as this goes on, uh, that's also afford- unaffordable for many people in the United States. Well, the lack of public health care in this country is uh, shocking. It's been a crisis for at least a couple of decades. And the pandemic didn't create the crisis, but has certainly shown a spotlight on the glaring inequalities in our health care system and also the risk to the public when we do not have a coordinated national public health system in place that can respond to something like an unprecedented and novel uh, virus that's extremely communicable and no one knows really how to fight it yet. Um, if we had a coordinated national response at the health care level, I think it would be quite different than what we're seeing, which is most people who are thrown out of work lost their uh, health insurance because it was tied to their employment. And many people do not seek health care either for a suspected COVID-19 um, infection or from other health issues because they literally can't afford to go to the dentist. I have a friend, right? I mean, to the doctor, I have almost no one in the U S has adequate dental care. I have a friend who's um, a big um, part of my team here in Maine on the campaign who has veterans administration care. He's a member of veterans for peace and he goes to the VA, but that does not include dental care. And this week he has a terrible toothache and he's very worried about if they're going to say he needs a root canal because he doesn't have thousands and thousands of dollars to fund that health care. So this system has been in meltdown for a while. And I think the pandemic is, I'm hoping, the final blow to this terrible for profit system. I'm a person who doesn't believe that the words profit and health care belong in the same sentence together. You know, not every human activity is appropriate uh, to seek profits and health care would be right at the top of that list. Right. I believe other people, I, I for one, would put on that list housing and also food. There's an aspect of this crisis that's been related to the food supply as well. A couple of different factors. One where the corporate owned food supply has not been able to respond to the changes in demand, uh, i.e. Mm-hmm. restaurants not ordering. And so they've been destroying food. Mm. Uh, that's that's you may have heard these stories about farmers plowing under sure. their crops. Uh, they've been calling it depopulating animals, where, of course, they're just going in and, and killing the animals. So mm-hmm. so there's people needing food and then there's food being destroyed. At the same time, we have uh, restrictions that were being put on immigrants, even though they will be needed. I mean, they're absolutely necessary in our current system for harvesting food. Indeed, the whole profit, you know, uh, corporate food production and agriculture at the, um, you know, factory farm level was, again, an unsustainable practice. It was uh, based on the exploitation of Uh, migrant workers who have very little ability to organize and struggle for uh, fair treatment, fair wages, and good working conditions because their immigration status is um, vulnerable. And then we have the problem of uh, profit rather than feeding people being the motivating factor. Um, Many uh, agricultural, um, you know, big scale farming and animal Husbandry projects are terrible ecological disasters, um, monocultures that create a lot of 
um, a susceptibility to disease and uh, using lots of pesticides and chemical fertilizers that pollute the water table and spread over into other people that are trying to use organic and biologically sound methods of growing food. It's just a, a kind of like a perfect storm of bad policy um, driven by lawmakers in Congress who are subsidized by huge corporations and even farm relief bills that come through. I live in a state with many small family farms. Uh, Maine is one of the few places where the average age of a farmer is dropping because many young people, even young people that have gone to university, come out of school and decide that what they'd really like to do is learn to farm sustainably. And um, uh, Maine is also unique in having a very high percentage of female owners of farms. Many of the new Mainers, we have a lot of uh, Maine has been a, um, an asylum state for many years, and um, we have had waves of immigration from various parts of the world that are suffering from uh, wars or famine or, you know, other kinds of um, pressures that cause people to move. And many of the African diaspora uh, immigrants to Maine have taken up farming. And so um, I think that uh, the high percentage of ownership by women is in, in part driven by that. So... I know about local food production and I, you know, my husband and I grow food every year, certainly not enough to feed ourselves, but we always try to support also our local farmers, uh, either through um, uh, going to the local farmer's market on a regular basis to buy food or sometimes participating in CSAs, community supported agriculture, um, you know, local and sustainable uh, ways to feed ourselves are, I think, extremely important to our survival as a species in the years going forward. We we can't keep doing these expensive, unsustainable practices and think that uh, the the biosphere will just absorb an uh, infinite amount of pollution and uh, uh, you know poor water use. It's also you know, we haven't even really talked about that aspect of it, and as well the draconian immigration policies of the current administration, which are arguably worse than under the Obama administration, but they were pretty bad then too, uh, separating families, um, deporting people, um, uh, in putting people in indefinite detention for long periods of time simply because their immigration status is questioned. Um, that is the workforce that feeds the U.S. And I often wonder if do, do our lawmakers understand that our food supply, most Americans' food supply, is dependent on the labor of those um, guest workers in our country? It seems like a lot of the politicians in Washington, D.C. are not actually particularly intelligent or well-informed people in many cases. And given that most Americans don't have much knowledge about where their food comes from, I wouldn't be surprised. It's true. Um, you know, I'm uh, about to retire from my job as a teacher, and I, um, you know, grew up in a time when some of the things that we were taught about our system of government turned out to be uh, really false. And I'm a, a somewhat idealistic person, thus I would be running to represent Maine in the U.S. Senate under a ranked choice voting system. But one of the things that I've been struck with a lot recently is I can remember my father, who also was in uh, public administration, and um, explaining what the difference was between a meritocracy and like, a you know, an aristocracy or other form of um, nepotistic or, you know, the other forms of a government where in a meritocracy, uh, supposedly, I mean, he, I'm white and he had explained white privilege to me when I was very, very young. Um, but he was, you know, kind of presenting it to me as if race or, or class had no a a effect, which of course it does. But he was basically saying, you know, the reason that you want a meritocracy is because you want the best talent and the best minds and the best thinkers uh, running things. You don't want a system where someone got the job because they're somebody's brother-in-law or somebody's son, and they are incompetent to do the job, and they really aren't accountable to the people, which is what our form of government was supposed to be about. So I think the just really um, almost clownishly bad um, mismanagement of this pandemic at the, at the executive, uh, in the executive branch of the federal government has been really shocking. 
Um, and the, the legislative branch, I mean, there certainly are some good members of Congress in the House and even some good senators that, that uh, you know, struggle for the people. But for the most part, um, it's based on who they know and how much money they can raise, really, in campaigning. And that does not lead to our getting the best folks in office who really understand what people are struggling with and what our priorities should be. Right. Right. It's because money is such a, a large part of it. So campaign finance, finance reform must also be on your radar. Well, you know, it's interesting here in Maine, we do have a clean elections fund and many people run for office by qualifying to receive clean election funds. However, this particular race uh, for the U.S. Senate does not qualify for that program. So um, some of the people running in the U.S. Senate race that I'm in have sworn not to raise money. There's an interesting independent candidate who uh, campaigns almost entirely on Twitter, and um, she raises money for uh, charitable causes and um, sectors of society that need funding rather than raising money for her campaign. And it's a very interesting approach. Um, However, uh, I'm a, I started out as a Green Party candidate. I am. I was a member of the Green Party, and I applied for ballot access as a Green here in Maine, and um, put together a team and raised some money. Um, we've raised about fifty thousand dollars at this point since August. But uh, some of that money we used to hire a ballot access coordinator who had done ballot access before in Maine and knew you know knew how to go about that. And it was impossible to get on the ballot as a green. They had um, made the, the two corporate parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, have gamed the system such that a third party candidate really uh, cannot get ballot access under the rules as they uh, put them in place. And um, a reporter for a, a, one of the big dailies here, the Bangor Daily News, got the Secretary of State to admit that in an article about how much difficulty we had getting on the ballot as Greens. So what we did was when we saw that we weren't going to make the deadline, um, you had to do all your uh, signature gathering during ice storm season in Maine. Maine has a pretty harsh winter and uh, you had to do it all by March 15th. And um, so what we did was I unenrolled from the Green Party reluctantly, and now I'm an, uh, considered an independent, which meant we had to gather twice as many signatures, 4,000 rather than 2,000, but we could gather them from any registered voter. So on Super Tuesday, Maine had a Super Tuesday primary this year for the first time, and we just stood outside the polling stations. A great, huge, you know, big team of volunteers went out into the field that day. And we got over 9,000 signatures in one day to get on the ballot. So I'm not taking any corporate donations. I will not accept or solicit donations from corporate CEOs, uh, corporate lobbyists or the super PACs that launder corporate money. Um, so I'm never going to raise the millions and millions of dollars that the two, um, you know, corporate candidates will. But at the same time, if I had not raised any money, I probably wouldn't be on the ballot because I wouldn't have been able to hire at a very, very reasonable rate, a uh, young ballot access coordinator that, that knew what he was doing and, and that guided us through the process. So I'm a little bit ambivalent about the um, in money and politics. One of the things I didn't realize about running, I, I've been a, a union negotiator, like I was vice president and chief negotiator of my teacher's local bargaining unit um, for several years. So that's my experience with electoral politics, which um, isn't very deep. But um, I quickly realized, oh, this is a team sport. I am the spokesperson for this team. And certainly I have a leadership role, but this is about a team of people. And um, so one of the other things that I realized early on is, oh, and a political campaign is also a job creation program because you do um, hire staff to, uh, you know, to uh, volunteer, coordinate your volunteers or, um, you know, um, coordinate your communications. Again, this is a Green Party campaign at heart. So all the people on the staff are really true believers who are doing it, not for the um, very modest amount of, uh, you know, money that they've contracted to receive. But they're doing it because they really believe that under ranked choice voting, we have an actual shot to put an independent Green in the U.S. Senate. So it's a very exciting possibility for us all. Yeah, it is exciting. And you've been getting some some attention outside of Maine, for sure. 
Um, and you've mentioned ranked choice voting twice now. So let's go ahead and talk about that and what that means, because I think most people haven't heard of what that is, but Maine is actually using that this year. Yeah, Maine's been using it, and they were using it in 2018. And in 2018, in the Maine only has two congressional districts. We don't have a lot of population. And in the second district where I live, which is the more northern, poorer part of Maine, um, we uh, had a Republican incumbent, Bruce Poliquin, who was very unpopular. Um, he refused to meet with constituents and actually would run away from reporters. And, you know, when people wanted to talk to him, um, he was challenged by a a relative newcomer who had been in the main legislature, uh, Jared Golden, was the Democrat challenging him. And then there were two independent candidates on the ballot. And it was ranked choice voting. So the way it went was this. If anyone gets a majority of the votes in the first round, then boom over, ranked choice voting doesn't really kick in. But in that race, neither the incumbent nor the Democratic challenger nor either of the independents uh, reached the you know over 50% mark. So in round two, the... Um, Secretary of State takes whoever uh, gained the least votes in round one is crossed off the ballot. So that person is now out of the race. And they look at the people who picked that candidate for their first choice. Who did they pick for their second choice? And they redistribute. They transfer those second choice votes to the remaining three candidates. And if that puts somebody over 50 percent, then that person has declared the winner. In the case of the congressional race, it took two rounds of eliminating the independents. And lo and behold, the, the Democrat had more uh, votes, did reach the over 50 percent and took the seat. So there's a precedent for seeing the power of ranked choice voting, um, particularly when the incumbent is an unpopular conservative I'm running against Susan Collins. She used to be one of the most popular senators in the country. She's now the most unpopular for various reasons. And so she's vulnerable. And the challenger uh, hasn't been named yet. The primary in that race was pushed by a month. It won't be held until mid-July. So they don't um, really know who the Democrat will be, um, but they think it will probably be um, the Speaker of the House in, in Maine, the Maine Legislature Speaker of the House. And she is a very centrist, very corporate Democrat. And um, but would either one of them be able to pull more than 50 cent percent of the votes? They're certainly not polling over 50 percent. So the presence of a strong progressive candidate such as myself uh, increases the likelihood of our um, unseating the very unpopular Susan Collins. Because if someone votes first for me, they give me their first choice vote, they're very unlikely to put Susan Collins second. And if someone gives the Democrat the first po choice vote, whoever that Democrat turns out to be, they're very unlikely to put Susan Collins second. So um, it helps also, It uh, exit polls show that it brings out more progressive voters when there is a strong progressive in the race. When asked, who would you have voted for if, um, you know, say Jill Stein wasn't on the ballot, many people say, I wouldn't even have come out to vote. I, I wouldn't have voted for either of the two corporate parties. Um, so it's an interesting uh, voting system that we're getting used to. We passed it by referendum in Maine. And then the legislature refused to enact it. So we passed it again by referendum in Maine. And then they, they did enact it. Um, unfortunately, the governor's race is one of the ones that doesn't come under ranked choice voting. Uh, the Maine constitution would have to be amended to allow the governor's race. But all the other um, you know, state level races are ranked choice voting. And the city of Portland, the biggest city in Maine, recently uh past ranked choice voting on the Super Tuesday election for their municipal elections as well. Many municipalities in the country have it. New York City has it. Uh, Berkeley and San Francisco have it. And then uh, the state of Massachusetts is right now gathering signatures to try to get a ranked choice voting referendum on their November ballot. I believe the city of Minneapolis has it as well. I think a lot of cities do that. That's a partial list. I'm not um, I did not work on getting ranked choice voting in. I signed the signed the referendum petitions each time and voted for it when, you know, I had a chance. But um, it's uh, it's a very powerful game changer. I probably would not have agreed to take on the project of running for the U.S. Senate if it weren't for the ranked choice voting factor.
Right. Well, I'm glad to hear that you've got it there and that it's spreading. I first heard about it in the year 2000 when I was working for the Nader campaign. It was new to me then. So, and mm -hmm. really, it was it was just a dream at that point. So that's nice mm -hmm. to know it's 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 being implemented. So it's got to be a challenge to be running a campaign um, at a time like this when you can't really do appearances and all that kind of thing in person. It's challenging. Um, there are some things about it that, that make it more difficult. And then and there are other things about it that, that make it, that are advantages, oddly enough. Um, it certainly is harder to not be able and to go out and be with the team and to hug each other and eat some nachos together and, you know, uh, swap stories about our time in the trenches during ballot access and fire up the team to go forward. So that part, of course, is difficult. Um, the one of the things that that has been easier, however, is that um, I live pretty far from Portland. I live about two hours from Portland, and um, my husband was is my driver, and he was pretty exhausted from doing a great deal of driving um, because every weekend we had to be somewhere else, and um, so. In many ways, it's gained me time to work on the campaign. I can get up in the morning and get right to it and put in a 12-hour day or sometimes a 15-hour day without having to stop and get ready and get in the car or pack a suitcase. And so in that way, it's it's gained a lot more time. Um, you know, uh, most of my campaign communication is done online anyway, using platforms. We've certainly learned to use Zoom a lot better and other forms right now we're using Skype and I'll probably do a Google Hangout with my sons later on today. So we're learning to use those platforms. One of the things I had been doing was interviewing um, volunteers on the campaign to ask them how they're doing in the pandemic, how's the pandemic affected them. And it's been an interesting question uh, because uh, the variety of some of my campaign volunteers are Vietnam veterans who became disenchanted with U.S. foreign policy decades ago and have worked for social change ever since. And some of them are high school students that are awakening to uh, what a mess we're in and wondering what could be done about it. And kind of everything, every age group and different possible um um, you know, either students or, or uh, professions in between. So it's a very interesting, uh, they, they have a variety of answers when you say, how is the pandemic affecting you? Um, and then my second question to them is, why would you be motivated to continue volunteering on a U.S. Senate campaign in the middle of a public health crisis that you're struggling with? And those answers are remarkably similar because almost all of them say, because now more than ever, we need good leadership in Washington, D.C. We're not getting it uh, in many cases. And um, I know you well enough to believe that you will faithfully represent the group that's, um, you know, working so hard to get you there. So um, but I do those interviews over Zoom and then I, you know, edit them a little bit and put them on YouTube. I, I do a short video a day. One of my limitations here um, is that my, I don't have very good Internet connectivity, really. And so um, it takes me a long time to upload even a, a very short video. So I have to limit myself to about two minutes. If I make a video longer than two minutes, I, I really can't upload it um, at the speed that I'm using. So, you know, we're flexible problem solvers, I think. When I was, a, you know, I have three grown children. I have three sons who are grown ups and have their own children, own families. And they when I was raising them, my number one goal was to make them uh, flexible problem solvers, to to give them the experiences and the support for their education, both in and out of school, so that they would be able to meet problems in an open minded way, able to break paradigms if they needed to and really think out of the box, because I realized I have no idea what they will be facing in terms of when they're my age. What will the world look like? Clearly, it will look very different, but I I can't predict what they will, what problems they will have to solve. So I think that that's something I'm a I'm a teacher. I've I'm, you know, I've been teaching 25 years. That was a career change for me. I owned a small family business before that for a while. And I've worked in different fields. Um, originally, I was a journalism uh, student and um, I've worked in journalism some. But uh, being a pro flexible problem solver is probably the number one 
um, job quality uh, quality we look for when we're adding people to our team because you just don't know what's going to happen. Did we know a pandemic was going to shut everything down? We had to make arrangements to go to the Secretary of State's with our petitions um, and make special arrangements, mask up, glove up, go into the state offices in uh, the state capitol, put the box down, back away. The, the Deputy Secretary of State came out, masked and gloved, took the box, took it inside, set it down, left it for 48 hours, and then they processed the signatures. Nobody foresaw that. It was kind of them to make those arrangements for us. And one of the odd things is we had gathered over 9,000 signatures, but all the city clerks and town clerks had to um, certify that those really were registered voters. So once we gather the signatures, we send them to the towns and cities, then they send them back to us, then we can turn them in. Well, we still didn't have a single petition from Portland, which is by far Maine's biggest city. It's really the only significant urban area in Maine because the, that was the epicenter of the COVID-19 uh, outbreak in this state and the town clerk, the city uh, offices in Portland had shut down very early on. We had just turned in our petitions to them. And, it and at some point we had to decide, should we just go ahead and turn in like 5,500 of them? That's more than enough to get us on the ballot and not wait for any of the Portland because we had thousands of signatures in Portland. We decided, yeah, I guess we should probably do that. So it's kind of, um, odd and ironic that we get on the ballot without a single signature from Maine's biggest city. And and really the center of our support is Portland's a very uh, lefty city, very artistic city, and there are a lot of young, um, oh, eyes open organizers in the Portland area that are struggling for, um, you know, housing security, food security, um, and equal access to, you know, the basics of life. There's a there's a large community there that's that's very friendly to our campaign, and um, I know that they well many of them are, are are you know key volunteers that have worked really hard even since the pandemic uh, kind of shut us all in our homes. Um, I wanted to ask you: Had you seen uh, the film, the Michael Moore produced film that recently came out, Planet of the Humans? You know, I have to admit, I haven't seen it yet. I've read about a zillion articles about it and talked to many people about it, but I have not seen it yet. Um, I think I have a pretty good grasp of what the thesis of the film is. Right. I saw it recently, too. And, and the issues that are covered in there are issues that I've written about myself before. I've spent a lot of time in the Southern California deserts. And so I've seen firsthand the ecological effects of putting mm -hmm. in industrial sized uh, solar or wind farms into these mm -hmm. areas, because mm -hmm. what you're doing is completely destroying wildlife habitat by building them. And then there's further effects. I mean, the, the windmills do kill birds and, and, and bats, and, and some of the solar farms do too, like the ones that focus the solar energy up to the towers, like Ivanpah. That's a, a notorious one, notorious bird killer. And so when we talk about um, a Green New Deal, when we talk about renewable energy, it's true that these downsides of renewable energy are often left out of it, uh, if only because we don't know about it. So I was just wondering if you had a, an outlook on that. Sure. Um, that's a great question. Green New Deal is a term that gets bandied about quite a bit. It originated with the Green Party, I think, in 2012 is the first time they published about it. But um, many, of course, thinkers have used that phrase for describing what they think the kind of transformation we need to undergo. The Democratic Party has kind of, uh, you know, taken it from the Greens, watered it down quite a bit. Um, I my uh, vision of a Green New Deal is um, compl is very much based on demilitarizing our industrial capacity, and I think that that is a significant difference because. Um, one of the things I'm very involved in here in Maine before the, uh, the campaign came along is a campaign to um, uh, pressure General Dynamics, which owns the Bath Iron Works shipyard, uh, which is like a heritage shipyard here in southern Maine, to convert their industrial capacity instead of building only warships for the U.S. Navy to build um, clean energy systems, to build the light rail 
transportation system that Maine lacks and we're all in our cars driving around as a result, or to even to build hospital ships would be an improvement. And the reason that that is so significant, the demilitarized part is um, many people in the U.S. are unaware of the Pentagon's role in driving climate change. Not only is the Pentagon a huge polluter, but it also um, you know, in, in terms of chemical as, and um, polluting water tables where its bases are and so forth. But it's the largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels on the planet. And its greenhouse gas emissions exceed that of 140 nations, if it were a nation. So the Pentagon has been driving climate change while waging wars to control access to fossil fuel um, in other parts of the world. And it's a vicious cycle because we're driving climate change by doing that. If you would stop building weapon systems, that's one win for the climate right there. And if you, instead of, um, you know, throwing people out of work and shutting down the factory, you said, no, now we're going to build that light rail system that everyone's been dreaming of. It actually, economists research repeatedly using models of how much an investment of a certain amount of dollars generates in terms of jobs have um, shown uh, that you would generate probably 50% additional jobs if you trans, uh, if you converted from building weapon systems to building uh clean energy systems. Building weapon systems is not a very good jobs program, although our members of Congress constantly tell us they can't stop doing that because jobs, everybody needs the jobs. You know, we're talking good union jobs with benefits, um, but building weapon systems is kind of capital intensive and involves a lot of robotics. So it doesn't actually generate as many jobs as investing that same amount of money in many different sectors of the economy. Um, so that would, you know, it's a just transition. There's no reason that people need to lose their livelihood. Uh, what, what we need are more good livelihoods for people um, to be able to feel proud of what they're building, feel that it's not wrecking the, um, you know, survival prospects for humans on the planet, but actually increasing our ability to survive and, and um, you know, also to um, actually reduce the carbon footprint of that factory by, by building solutions rather than something that exacerbates the problem. Um, the other part of a Green New Deal that I think is super important is uh, more relative to the point you were making about the big solar farms and wind farms, and that is to create consumer-owned utilities that are locally managed, that produce uh, power locally, where it's and where and rather than transmitting it over thousands of miles for the profits of, you know, Goldman Sachs and a couple of big multinational corporations, but keeping the uh, power, having it be used locally where it's generated and um, forming kind of, um, I think the terms that they use are to say, call it a, like a microgrid. There's a town right near where I live that's had its own electric utility, consumer owned utility for years now. Their rates are lower than the rest of us are paying to the big Spanish company that, that owns our electricity uh, production and they when the when a storm knocks our power out which happens fairly often here a lot of trees um, they get their power back sooner and I know the technology exists to couple microgrids with other microgrids if there's a need to share power and also to uncouple so that it becomes again more local and, and more controlled by the the consumers that are using it there's a really interesting bill before the main legislature right now to turn central main power which is owned by a a huge spanish company um, into a consumer owned utility for the state. Maine doesn't have a lot of people. We have like a, you know, a million and a half people. Um, it's certainly plausible that we could have our own electric utility. Right now, one of the big fights in my state is um, halting a project that Hydro Quebec, who uh, builds these mega dams that flood an area the size of the country of Ireland with 14 inches of water destroying the indigenous um, food gathering, hunting and fishing culture that's existed there for tens of thousands of years. And these mega dams feed into these huge hydropower 
uh, projects. And right now uh, they're trying to cut down a big wide swath, like a sw- uh, the size of the New Jersey Turnpike through the Maine woods, part of the last pristine uh, woods in Maine, in order to sell the electric power generated by the mega dams in Quebec, in Canada, to Massachusetts. So it would pass through Maine without losing power all the way. It's very inefficient to, to transmit power in that way over long distances. And the people of Maine might get a few jobs out of it. A couple of towns in Maine have been promised, you know, benefits. But really, it's a it's a project for very wealthy corporations to become even more wealthy. And um, it's just bad on so many levels. Uh, Hydropower is being sold as clean energy because water going over a dam looks pretty clean, but the effect of drowning the arboreal forests that are, that creates the reservoir that feeds into the mega dam, the methane that is generated by drowning all that vegetation actually makes the greenhouse gas profile of hydropower way higher than even like a coal-fired electric plant or a gas-fired electric plant. So these kind of huge industrial solutions to local energy needs are, are a bad idea on so many levels. I, I, I would really like to be part of uh, getting us back to you know, uh, locally produced food and locally produced energy. And, of course, the movie that you referenced um, – makes the point any of these clean technologies uh, aren't going to save you because if consumption continues to rise then uh, you're just finding new ways to to generate power that shouldn't be used in the first place really uh, you know downsizing and realizing that um, capitalism is based on constant growth and and that's not sustainable On a finite planet, you can't have growth that never ends without trashing the life support system of the planet as we see ourselves doing. So making some having the people involved. I mean, I think this is what's wrong when these decisions are being made in the boardroom at Goldman Sachs. They're not going to take into account what indigenous people have known all along. Almost any indigenous community that's still living in its traditional ways at any place on the globe knows that. You know, you need to plan ahead so seven generations after you, they will still have fish to eat. There will still be trees. Um, and uh, our industrial uh, high consumption driven by money and allowing people to hoard money to the extent that we do, it just isn't sustainable. No, it's not at all sustainable. A lot of times it seems like what we need to do is just uh, shrink everything. And that would solve a lot of problems all by itself. And it isn't that interesting how the pandemic has kind of done that for us against our will. It's been a very interesting situation. And in some ways, I think it's been an opportunity. Well, it's been an opportunity, it's been an opportunity to learn, but there's also an opportunity to remake things at this point. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... So one thing we haven't talked about so far, except in terms of energy, is the the military, U.S. foreign policy. And, of course, this is something that has been really missing from the national conversation since the W time, you know, presidency. You know, the real, the last time we had a sort of vibrant national anti-war movement was 2003 or so, you know. And, and yet it's uh, it, it has continued unabated, in, not just in the form of hot wars, but in the form of, of sanctions. And so I was hoping you'd like you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, this is really where I came up into political organizing as my uh, family grew up and didn't need my care anymore. I became very involved in um, uh, peace activism and anti-war organizing against specific wars. Um, so, uh, before I began to be more interested in the connection between militarism and climate, um, uh, damage, I was, uh, very 
much opposed. Well, you know, I'm uh, the age that I was a high school student during the Vietnam War. I wasn't old enough to have to worry about my friends being drafted, but um, that set my um, understanding of a, a, a good friend of mine that I went through high school with. Parents were socialists, and he brought a pamphlet and shared it with me at school that was written by the North Vietnamese. The analysis that you know, imperial wars are about money. And you can say they're about ideology and fighting communism and so forth, but really they're about corporate profits. And I began to look at America's constant warmongering with, you know, a different eye at that point when I was about 13, 14 years old. Um, over the years, it's certainly been borne out. And, um, you know, the probably war that I took the most mm -hmm. active stance against was our uh, war on Afghanistan. Um, where the 9-11 events were used as a pretext for attacking a country that didn't have any nationals involved in uh, the events of 9-11, but it had also been uh, a target of many empires. Um, the USSR wanted Afghanistan. Um, Alexander the Great wanted uh, Afghanistan. It's a very geographically um crucial, you know, powerful strategic area. And then, of course, then I was paying attention by the time the second Gulf War, the, the shock and awe attacks on Iraq in 03 were about to happen. And I was by then, um, my family has had grown up and I had enough time to really get involved in anti-war organizing. So um, I have a communications background. And so um, I was always interested in how is it that the uh, people in the U.S. don't seem to uh, be upset by wars? Uh, so many people turned out worldwide to protest the Iraq war. But when it went ahead anyway, most of them kind of faded. And then once uh, Barack Obama was elected president, most of the people that I had stood outside uh, holding signs with just vanished. They were not going to question a black president, America's first black president. They were not going to criticize him or question his foreign policy. And um, I noticed that you interviewed Margaret Kimberly recently for Counterpunch. Um, she's someone that I met in the anti-war movement um, around the time um, during Obama's first administration. And she and some of the other people that write for a black agenda report like Glenn Ford said, you know, you don't have to you don't have to give Barack Obama a pass on foreign policy just because he's black. He's still he's wrong. It, you know, he's conducting foreign policy the same way George Bush did. And um, it's wrong. And it's not uh, you know, we're not we're not going to support it no matter what, how we feel excited that finally the racial barrier was broken to put a black man in the White House. So the more and more that I have studied the financial underpinnings of our constant endless wars, I mean, this is the only war in which, okay, so, so starting in uh, 01, we have a war on terror. Well, terror is an abstract concept. Terror is never going to um, surrender because it's a, a thing like freedom or, you know, trust. It's not capable of waging war. It's a tactic people use in wars. So they created a war that could not be won by definition. And then uh, particularly in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq and Syria too. I was a history major. I am not aware. It's probably happened in history, but maybe I had not read about it, of other empires that actually funded their own enemies in order to keep the conflict going. Because the prophets are rolling in, whether we're, quote, winning or, quote, losing any of these wars. And every president has continued bombing civilians, um, you know, pretty much nonstop. Uh, the, the press doesn't pay much attention to it. The corporate press is owned by the same corporations that own uh, our government. So they're going to look aside from it. And really, this is where your corporate Democratic co candidates cannot talk about wars. I went to a um, an event in Portland that was a, a supposed town hall with or without Susan Collins. She is our current senator. And it was a, it was put on by a Democratic front group. They didn't say they were the Democratic Party, but it, they clearly were. And they took questions from the audience on cards. And then it was a very managed conversation. It took an hour for anyone to uh, be able to ask a question about climate. 
This was last fall. And no one ever uttered the words wars, military, Pentagon, you know, anything to do with the military was just verboten. You cannot talk about it. Democrats don't want to talk about it because they're no better than Republicans on that uh, score. They are no different. And it's a very, it's inconvenient for their false dichotomy narrative that, oh, guess what? We take donations from General Dynamics just like Republicans do. And we vote for uh, the biggest military budget ever in the history of the world, just like Republicans do. There we all are voting yes. Um, that is the main thing that has motivated my political activism for the last 20 years or so. And um, I, I think it's a, again, it's unsustainable. It's a, a disaster just barreling down on us. Um, when most people have no idea how much of the federal budget goes to the Pentagon and, and its contractors, if you look at the National Priorities Project, it's a um, nonprofit in Washington that, that sort of crunches the federal budget for us in a useful ways that we can look at, um, they uh, have shown year after year under Bush, under Obama, under Trump, um, that the Pentagon is getting more than 50% slice of the discretionary budget pie. Discretionary budget means not Medicare, not Social Security. Those are payroll tax supported programs that aren't really part of the budget Congress can spend. Um, when you look at the budget Congress can spend each year, it, it shows on paper to be about oh, 54% right now, but even that figure is uh, very underreported because all nuclear weapons uh, research and, and production is hidden in the energy budget. And then furthermore, the Veterans Administration that provides uh, care for people that have been in the military is, its, is a separate budget line. If you added them all together, it's about 70% of the federal budget year after year. Yet we can't afford Medicare for all. We can't afford uh, public higher education without student debt. We can't afford public transportation. We can't afford a, a strong pandemic response. Well, that's why we can't afford it. That, it is just completely obscene. And uh, you mentioned nuclear there for a moment. Uh, that's one thing that happened under the Obama administration that did not get much news coverage was his so-called modernization program for the nuclear arsenal. And that was like a trillion dollars, I believe. I don't remember how much it was, but I do remember by that time I was thoroughly disillusioned with Mr. Obama and not surprised that he basically he did whatever, you know, his big investors told him to do. He was, he worked for the corporations and that, that was very, very clear. I, I actually um, had supported his nomination. And as soon as he got the nomination, the first two votes as he was a Senator, then his first two votes were, he voted yes on the war supplemental. In those days they had the war, the war on terror as a sort of separate budget item that came along after the regular Pentagon base budget. He voted yes on that, and he voted to extend immunity to the telecoms that had spied on all of us and used our phone records illegally. So by the time, you know, I mean, that was like within the first two weeks of him being the Democratic Party nominee. Um, and I never supported him again. And, and his policies would, would bear out that he was his policies, you know, are Democrats like a more polite, more educated, more articulate uh, spokesperson for the corporations that rule us. And many people now prefer the bombastic world wrestling type braggadocio style of the current occupant of the White House. But I have to tell you, in terms of foreign policy and in terms of the federal budget, there really is not that much difference between those two administrations. No, and I believe, you know, as someone who studied history, you know, of course, that people have said this before. Uh, Smedley Butler, for example, um, W.B. W. E. B. Du Bois has, has it was already saying there was no difference between the parties in a long time ago. So I, it's definitely exciting to see uh, someone like you running who understands that about how little difference there is between those two big parties. 
And of course, I will be called lots of nasty names and, and be asked, so you want the demagogue with bad hair to be president again? What I've noticed in my lifetime that's been really interesting, Cole, is that the closer the two parties move together, the more vigorously the false dichotomy narrative is pushed. So there's a huge amount of play acting going on all the time about these huge differences between red and blue. Um, it's, you know, I mean, it, it makes sense that you can fool most of the people some of the time. I think that information control has been uh, the most significant factor in keeping people fooled and keeping people voting against their own interests and not uh, seeing the reality underneath the, the surface that's presented to them. Um, the I, We thought that the Internet and digital information age would make uh, information so much more accessible. It would be an equalizer. And in some ways that has happened because people who care to do the work of finding their own information, in fact, can find more information. If I was a, when I was a kid growing up reading the daily paper that my parents subscribed to and, you know, Time Magazine and Life Magazine, I wasn't, until my friend handed me that pamphlet from the North Vietnamese, I wasn't, there wasn't getting a lot of information that wasn't part of the mainstream. Uh, now in the last Five years, we've seen so much more internet censorship, so much more um, uh, managing of the information that reaches us on various platforms. And, you know, I mean, if you're committed, if you like research and you like reading and digging around, you can still find really good information. I notice you publish in Counterpunch quite, a, quite often. That's a paper that I, you know, an uh, internet source that I consider useful for uh, information that's outside the the narrative, but the vast majority of people that I've known in my life do not spend their time looking for that kind of, they th really actually think that national public radio is public radio. And that if they listen to that, they're well informed. They really believe that. I know I, I was raised in that milieu of people who, who, uh, where national public radio and PBS were really held up. And perhaps in the seventies, they, they were a little bit different than they are now, but now the, the corporate ownership of them seems, uh, nearly complete. Well, I think it was Noam Chomsky who said the American populace is the most heavily propagandized population that's ever lived. But there's a quote I've never been able to source that has intrigued me for years as a communications person, and that is, in really sophisticated propaganda, even the opposite isn't true. And, you know, really the power of propaganda is not so much in telling us what to believe. It's in... Um, putting the frame around what we should be looking at. It's directing our gaze and saying, here's where you should be paying attention. And anything outside of that uh, is not of interest. Don't pay any attention to that. Um, and, I, and I see the effect of that on people's understanding of what's going on. In some ways, when society really breaks down under the pressure of a public health crisis, it's good. I don't like to see people suffering or toddlers going hungry or, you know, people of color dying in way disproportionate numbers because their underlying health conditions were already poor due to poverty and racism in our health care system. But I do like it when the, uh, you know, sort of scales fall from our eyes and we realize what a bad system we live under because that offers us the hope that we will be motivated to say, what can I do? How can I join with others who understand this and try to craft something better so that our children and grandchildren have some hope of a, you know, a more survivable world than the one that we've lived in? Yes, because we're, we're in terms of survival, we're headed in the wrong direction right now. We sure are. And we're looking to take a lot of species down with us. I, I sometimes have the feeling the other life life forms on the planet are thinking, man, I wish those humans would get you know, their extinction event done with here so we could go back to, you know, the, humans have been the ultimate invasive species on the planet. And uh, th there have been so many extinctions of different other forms of life because of our bad practices. Yes, and it's only, of course, accelerated over the last, you know, 50 years. And there's the tendency for us to not know what we've lost as well. 
Yes. I used to um, travel a fair bit uh, to do anti-war uh, and peace work because I was involved with groups like UNEC that would have meetings in Washington, D.C., or I'd go to New York City or Boston or Albany. And a few years ago, I decided that I really wanted to reduce the, my carbon footprint for my activism. And I realized, you know, there's plenty I could be doing right here in Maine. I really don't need to travel. Um, I have a good friend, a neighbor who is a, was a, is a Penobscot man, was a chief of the Penobscots in the past, Barry Dana, um, who's endorsed my campaign and really been a supporter. And one of the, his uh, big, uh, you know, um, teaching points that he hammers on constantly is the need to stop flying. Flying is killing the Earth's atmosphere as a life support system. You've just got to stop. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's fast, convenient. So one of the pledges I've taken, if I am elected, is I won't fly back and forth between Washington and D.C. There is a train. I've, you know, I can take the train. I love taking trains. You can get a lot of work done on a train. But um, because, uh, you know, uh, that's another silver lining of the pandemic is that air travel has fallen off sharply. Um, unfortunately, the Pentagon has gone right on. Um, we have, uh, the, the, I mentioned Bath Ironworks earlier. The state would not shut down Bath Ironworks, even though it's an obvious incubator for the um for the COVID-19 disease because people work in very close quarters, like in the hulls of a, sh a ship. And they know that's an essential service. Building warships is an essential service. Um, so unfortunately, the Pentagon, one of the reasons their carbon footprint is so bad, their greenhouse gas footprint is so bad, is that the types of fuel that the military uses are much more polluting than the types that commercial airliners use. And um, But they've gone right on flying and right on bombing. And um, so we could have had even a better effect had that stopped during the pandemic. You would think that when humans are faced with such an unprecedented threat to their health as a group that they would reorder their priorities and say, wait a minute, what's important right now? You know, is it really drone bombing someone in Syria or um, is it figuring, putting all our resources into supporting the scientists who might uh, find a way out of this disaster? I think that paradigm shift is hard for a lot of people. And I think that, you know, wealth blinds people to the ability to see what their true priorities should be. Wealth blinds you from seeing your true priorities. I haven't heard it put exactly that way before. I like that. Yeah, it's not true of all wealthy people, but when we see, I was reading something, uh, a tweet someone had sent, how much wealth Jeff Bezos has gained just during the pandemic? I think it was $24 trillion. And this person said, if my wife who teaches reading to low-income kids in West Virginia um, worked for, I don't know, it was like hundreds of thousands of years, she could earn that amount of money, just the amount of money that his wealth has grown during the few weeks of the pandemic. How can someone actually need that much money? And then we see Amazon workers striking because they don't have PPE and they're being forced to work in conditions that are unsafe. And then they try to organize themselves and the organizer gets fired. I, I, it's very hard for me to understand such people are how how wealthy do you need to be was there no end to it you're willing to exploit you know thousands of people and and essentially condemn them to death because you need some more zeros on your bank account i just don't get it yeah there's there's something sociopathic or psychopathic going on there for sure i don't know the difference between the two but i do think that it, when you talk to regular people that across the board, they're much more reasonable and much more interested in cooperating. It's just, just that they feel disempowered. It's true. We've been told we have no power. And we've also been taught, at least in my lifetime, in this culture, violence is always the answer. It's the first thing you go to. It's your go-to strategy is dominating people through uh, superior force. Well, in fact, that's like a last resort. Uh, you know, most humans that have thrived and had a good uh, life-sustaining culture would try many different things, many types of cooperation or mediation or, you know, um, problem solving before they would go to brute force. But when you raise a whole generations of people grow up playing video games where you get points for killing people and that they 
and all the advertising that they see kind of sells them on this uh, might makes right narrative, it's hard for them to understand things differently. I can't tell you how many people have said, well, humans have always been violent. Well, you know, patriarchal societies that have written the history you've read have pretty much always been violent. Yes, but we have archaeological evidence of societies that were not violent. They had no weapons at all um, that existed in, you know, the ancient, um, you know, farming civilizations that that where people first began to cultivate food and so forth. So I think that um, paradigm shift is hard for people and it's all about narrative. So um, I'm very interested in helping to shift the narrative in the direction of just because you thought that's the way things had to be. What if you took a couple steps back from that and went down a different path? Might you be able to see things differently? Humans innately are cooperative. Um, they wouldn't have survived to this point if we didn't get together in groups and help each other through famines, through illnesses, uh, you know, through uh, accidents. Um, it's a it's a very false narrative to say that it's always the military that. I, you know, I mean, all the history that I read when I, when I was a young person, like, oh, you, the U.S. won World War II and we saved the world from the Nazis. Well, guess what? Now we are the Nazis. Not too surprisingly, because when World War II ended, the uh, German rocket scientists were whisked to the U.S. to develop atomic, you know, continue developing atomic weapons. And the Japanese um, bio, uh, you know, weapon uh, scientists were whisked to the U.S. to work on that. And um, now we have children in cages at the southern border, little children ripped from their mother's arms or their family's arms and kept indefinitely in concentration camps. Like what is actually different between it's a white supremacist system, just like the Nazis were. And apparently the whole COVID narrative that's coming out of the, um, you know, uh, executive branch of government is like, oh, we can let a bunch of people die. They're dispensable. We don't really, if they're not strong enough to survive them, we don't need them anyway. Um, this is an anti-life philosophy that I think if followed to its logical conclusion will result in the extinction of the human race. Yes, I'm afraid so. It does seem as though we're, we're headed that way. And I'm hoping uh, that the current crisis will lead to it uh, it could be an, an open door to going someplace else and, and doing something else gosh i sure hope so it really looks to me like it's being used as a pretext for uh, fomenting civil war in this country though actually yeah the people at the top are always going to i mean we can count on them to try to turn everything to their advantage you know and so I hear about the mutual aid efforts that are going on, for example, mm -hmm. and I feel some mm -hmm. hope, you know? So I think that the longer that normal is not going on, the better in that way. You know, uh -huh. the longer that people are separated, you know, the, the more of a chance there is to think about things in a different way and do things in a different way. And something like 75 to 80% of the population actually wants to keep the distancing uh, restrictions, et cetera, going mm -hmm. because they don't mm -hmm. feel safe yet. So it's a it's a vocal minority that's mm -hmm. probably getting too much media attention, uh, considering how much how much they really represent in the population. You know, of course they're getting too much media attention. How did we get the current president, who is clearly not in any way qualified to do the job, so much earned media, meaning just free media coverage? He was on the cover of the New Yorker so many times and, you know, Newsweek so many times. And during that process, I was thinking they're getting him elected. Why would they be giving him so much attention? Um, it, it's not warranted, but they are the ones who decide. So that's who they decided on. I don't know if they got more than they bargained for. You know what Frank Zappa said? I'm sure you've heard this quote. The, uh, you know, politics is the... Um, uh, entertainment division of the military industrial complex. That's a great quote. He really, he really hit it spot on with that one. He sure did. Yep. Cool. So we've been talking for a little over an hour and I feel like we've covered um, most of the important issues here. So I would say uh, if there's something we haven't hit, hit it. And if not, tell us and our listeners where they can find out about you and help to support your campaign. 
Sure. Thanks, Cole. I think we've covered uh, most of the platforms um, that I'm running on. I will uh, tell people that we welcome volunteers and support from all over the country, and we have volunteers and supporters from all over the country. Our website is Lisa for that's spelled out F O R Maine M A I N E dot org. And if you uh, visit our website and you think that our values align with yours, we would love to have you. You can indicate that you'd like to donate or that you'd like to volunteer, and we will be in touch to um, ask you how you can help us out and get the word out. Um, we also have a presence on all the usual social media platforms and our. Or, you know, username on all those is Lisa for Maine. So if you go on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, uh, YouTube, I've been making this series of very short videos daily. I made one in my garden yesterday. Uh, instead of rototilling with a gasoline powered rototiller this year, my husband and I used a really cool tool that a neighbor lent us to turn the garden over. And, um, you know, Check us out and see if you feel that we would represent you better in Washington than the people that are doing it, and we'd love to have you on the team. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.